Good morning. Thank you, Brother John, for that. It was very, very good. Very appreciative of, of your words. And um, um, it's, it's always striking to me when we, we think about the Lord's Supper and things that we do in, in remembrance of Jesus. And it's, it's important for us as Christians to think about these things, pray on these things. So as we've been going through this month talking about prayer and thinking about prayer, we've spent some time studying the topic. We've spent some time uh, just really just talking about and, and thinking about what prayer is and what the Bible says about um, this, this great part of the Christian walk. And last week we looked at 2 Samuel chapter 7 and we spent some time examining David's prayer as David is given information from God about the future. And so he's grateful and speechless and we recognize from that prayer that we can learn how to um, to think to the future and think to what God is going to do for us as a way of motivating us to, to go before our Heavenly Father uh, in prayer. So this morning we're going to be looking at another prayer of David, um, another one of David's great prayers in the Bible. There are several, but this one is one that is probably one of the more famous prayers of David from Psalm 51. And in this prayer, we're going to be talking about the topic of confession, that we confess to God in word, in prayer, that we go to our Heavenly Father, that we confess our sins, that we desire forgiveness of, of God. So we're going to be talking about that, and we're going to be using Psalm 51 as our model to kind of learn how to do that and what that looks like and, and what attitude we need to have as, as Christians. So as we look at the text, if you want to go ahead and turn to Psalm 51, there's a few passages before that one, but that will be our main, our main text. And, and of course, in the context, this is where David is really just pouring his heart out. He's guilty of a great sin. He's guilt. He knows he's guilty. He's been convicted of that, and now he is. He's pouring his heart out to God um, because of what he has done, confessing his sin to God. And so I got to thinking about this idea of confessing sins or confessing in general. And you know, I was thinking about different attitudes that I have had and and others have had and, and probably do have and different people and what they what they do when they've done something something wrong and and some people um, I think are very quick you know to confess they just don't you know they know they've done wrong they're quick to confess they they're they don't want it on their conscience they don't want to think about it um, and they have some remorse and and so they confess very quickly to whatever it is that they are doing and there but there are some people and maybe if you fit into some of these categories so maybe these will be helpful for us to just speak them out uh, but there are some people who try to hide their guilt and they try to hide whatever it is that they have done in hopes that no one will find out or or maybe over time maybe over time that they will even forget about it or if others do know about it maybe they'll forget about it and so there's a sense that that some will attempt to to cover up or to to hide whatever it is they have done and even even still there are some who become bitter and angry and resentful towards others and even themselves as as the guilt of their sin just eats them up on the inside you know and it's it's not so much that they were going to confess or be remorseful or even try to hide it but they just they just get angry and they lash out and they speak out against people especially those who are trying to convict them of, of sin. And so there's all these different people, there's all these different responses to doing wrong and different ways that people deal with this um, situation. And, and so just kind of as an illustration, I think we can, all, we, we can all relate to this. Think back when you were a kid and, and you, you did something 
you know, at home that was wrong and, and you were disobedient to your parents or maybe you did something like break your mother's lamp. You know, you, your mom might have had a favored lamp and, and you, you were told not to run in the house or play ball in the house and you did it anyway. And next thing you know, crash, you know, and you're thinking, oh, no, you know, mom's going to find out. And so you're you're guilty of, of disobedience. You're guilty of breaking your mom's lamp. Do you remember how you felt? Now, your situation may be different. It may be something else, but just think about that for a minute. There, there's that moment in time where the offense has been made, and the person, the mother, the father, whomever, finds out, right? And there's always that period of time in between, you know, that, that's kind of, you know, just sick to your stomach feeling. You know, there's a sense of fear, there's a sense of just, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it, but I'm trying to explain it to you this way because I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's just, you're guilty, and you know that they're going to find out, and, and the punishment's coming, and you're just, ah, oh, you know, what do you do? What do you say? You know, maybe I can run away. Maybe I can pack my bags and leave home and run away, and they'll never find out, and I'll be free from, from my mom finding out that I did this thing, you know? Or, or maybe if I hide somewhere in the house that, you know, over time she'll forget about it, and it won't be as bad, and, you know, whatever. I mean, you, you just, you think about all these things as a kid because, there's that moment in time where you realize I'm guilty. I've done what I'm not supposed to do. And these are the consequences of my guilt. And my mom's going to find out. And I don't want her to. And I don't want to pay the price. And I don't want to admit that I've done wrong. And, and it's miserable, isn't it? It's miserable. But then, do you remember what happens afterwards, you know, after your parents find out and your mom finds out and, you know, you're given some kind of punishment most of the time, right? You know, we understand that. We're expecting that. But they find out. But most of the time, what do they do? They say, what happened? Right? I mean, it's like, Mom, you know what happened, you know? I mean, I broke the lamp, you know? And I was throwing the ball. I was doing what I was not supposed to do. And, and the lamp broke. And you already know what happened. And, and there's no reason to go through this. But, but isn't that what they always ask? I mean, as parents, isn't that what we always ask? What happened? Well, we already know, don't we? We already know. But what do we want? What does Mom want? What does Dad want? What do we want? We want that kid to confess, right? To say, I did it. How'd this happen? Well, I was doing the thing you told me not to do. And this happened. Didn't I tell you this was going to happen? You know, and you, you know, and you go through that process, but that's part of, of that offense. It's part of disobedience. It's part of confession. It's part of owning up to our guilt is, is getting to that point where you're having to confess that you have committed this offense, that you've done this, and these are the results. I've disobeyed you. I've disappointed you. I've done this, and now here we are. And there are times when that's uncomfortable, isn't it? And, and we don't really want to go through that. You know, there might be a period of time where, you know, you're, you're, you receive some kind of punishment. Maybe you can't sit down for a few days because, you know, mom gets out the belt or something. Or, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, the worst one probably is getting to hear it for the next 50 years. You know, that's a, that's a tough one. But, uh, you know, we, we get some kind of punishment. There's something coming. There's some kind of result. But there's a sense of relief, isn't there? After, after it's all over and after the punishment has been given and after that confession has been made, that you are putting yourself in the hands of a mother, of a father who loves you. And even though you're disobedient, they still love you. And even though you, you broke their favorite lamp, they still love you and they have compassion for you. They may be mad for a while, but... But there's a sense of relief when that's all over. And you say, I'm sure glad that's over. I'm just glad that it's done, you know? I'm glad that it's over. I'm glad that that's been confessed. I'm glad that that's off my conscience. I'm glad that mom knows. I'm glad that I've been punished. Well, we're not always glad that we're punished, but we're glad that that part of it's over because we knew it was coming. And there's this sense of saying, I'm just glad it's over. I'm glad it's over. 
And I think as we read Psalm 51 that we're seeing the spirit of David and as he's crying out in this confession, and he did a lot worse than breaking a lamp, obviously, but in his confession to God as he is, as he's saying, Lord, I know, I know who you are and I know what I have done against you. I know that the sin that I have committed is great and I just want you to know that I know, that you know, but I know who you are. And I'm making this confession to you. I'm making this appeal to you because I know you. And I know you know me. And there's that sense of relief of just saying, this is what has happened. This has been committed. And so one of the verses I want us to look at, not in relation, but in relation, but not in Psalm 51, is from 1 John chapter 1 and 9. This is John speaking to Christians, and he says, he says, if we confess our sins, that, that he, God, is faithful and righteous, so that he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. You see, as covenant people of God, as people who are part of God's family, as those of us who are able to call God Father, as we are in this covenant relationship with God, we can go to our Heavenly Father. We can go to God. We can go to Him with our sins, and we can pray to Him, and we can confess those sins to Him. And we can say, Lord, I have sinned against you. And we know that the God to whom we pray, to whom we call Father, is a faithful God. That He is a righteous God. That He is a forgiving God. That He is a willing God. So with that in mind, look at Psalm 51. Now the Bible, your Bible, probably has some kind of a header to this psalm. It says something like this. It says, the, For the music director, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into uh, Bathsheba. And so we were understanding the context, and, and so that kind of sets us up for the rest of the, the content of this message. So this is a psalm of David, obviously. This is David's prayer to God for his sin that he had committed, murder, adultery, the things that he had done, these grievous sins, taking advantage of his position as king. But notice who it's for. I think this is interesting because we often think about this psalm as very personal, and it is very personal to David. Uh, but look who it's for. It's for the music director. What is the music director going to do with this? He's going to give it to the choir. He's going to give it to the people of worship. He's going to take it to the people of Israel. And this is something that Israel would sing. This is something they were supposed to repeat and meditate on. It wasn't just something personal, even though it was, but it was something that all of Israel need to know. They all needed to know about this. They all needed to understand the words of David and sing these words, think about these words, meditate on these words, and apply them to their own life as people of Israel. God wants his people to know this prayer. He wants his people to sing it. He wants his people to remember it. He wants his people to remember and worship to him. That this is part of worship, is confessing that we have sinned against our God and we desire, we desire reconciliation, we desire forgiveness so that we can come before him, humbly before him in worship. So all those, this is very personal. It's also very public. Look at the first verse, first few verses. It says, be gracious to me, God. David says, be gracious be gracious, have mercy on me, mother, from breaking your lamp, right? Be gracious on me according to your faithfulness, according to your greatness of your compassion. Wipe out my wrongdoings, wash me thoroughly from my guilt, and cleanse me from my sins, right? So here's a question. Would you tell somebody, somebody that you have wronged, would you confess to them that you have sinned, that you have committed something against them, some kind of offense against them, would you say something to them if you believed that the person in whom you offended was not just, was not good, was not a person that was going to treat you right, was not going to deal with the situation well? 
Would you be willing to confess to them that you have offended them if you believe the person was not forgiving? And you just knew that as soon as you said it, that it was going to be something unjust, that whatever punishment they dueled out was going to go far beyond whatever offense that you have made, that they weren't going to be right in their punishment, that they weren't going to be good to you because of your confession. How willing would you be to confess a sin to that person, an offense? You wouldn't be, right? You'd be want to hide it. You'd be thinking, you know, this is going to make it all worse. It's not going to make it any better. If I tell them what I've done, then the whole thing is going to be worse because I don't trust this person. And I know this person's not going to treat me well, and I know this person's not going to deal with the situation well. But what David is saying that he knows his God. He knows his God. That God knows him, right? David knew his God and his God knew him. And he knows him as a God who is compassionate, loving, kind, willing to forgive, that he desires reconciliation even in our weakness, even in our greatest offense, that he desires reconciliation. And David is praying to this God. He's opening up to this God. And he knows who he is. And he's appealing to this character, this character of God, that he desires to speak to and to confess to. So God already knows. We're not hiding anything, are we? <laughs> I think sometimes we feel like we are. We're kind of thinking, well, you know, nobody else knows about my sins and nobody else knows about what I do. You know, nobody else knows about what I think. God knows. We're not hiding anything from him. We're not hiding anything from him. He knows everything that we do and everything that we think and everything that we say. There's nothing that is hidden from his sight. He knows every thought. He knows every action. He knows everything that you do, right? See, when, when your mom walks in the room and finds the lamp broken on the floor, she already knows, doesn't she? I mean, she's no, she knows exactly what happened. And she knows exactly who is at fault. But she still is going to ask you what happened. Right? Why? Why does she ask that question? Why does she want to know? Why does she want us to confess? Because she wants us to own up to it, right? She wants us to admit it. She wants to know how sorry we are for disobeying her. Right? You know, if we just go about and we're hot-headed and we say, well, yeah, Mom, you know, you shouldn't have put the lamp there and I don't care and, you know, I don't, I don't really feel any remorse at all. What's going to happen? I mean, how is she going to feel about that? When, when is forgiveness going to come? When is compassion going to be dueled out and given? When, when is love going to be expressed when we respond in hate and anger and frustration and we just say, well, I don't care. Do what you're going to do. It doesn't matter to me. You know, I don't care that I wronged you and offended you and disobeyed you. Where is that sigh of relief? Where is that sense of, ah, it's over, it's out, they know about it, you know, and they have forgiven me, and the punishment has been dueled out, and here I am on the other side of that. The relationship that was once fractured because of my offense is now healed, and we're back, we're back, and we're able to live and be free from the guilt of the offense. But isn't that true with God also, that God knows, he knows everything that we've ever done. He doesn't need us to tell him, but he needs to know how sorry we are. He needs to know that we have repented and we have confessed and we know that we've offended him. He needs to know that we are appealing to him as a God who is merciful and as a God who is compassionate, as a God who desires reconciliation so that that offense that fractured our relationship can be dealt with and that the guilt of that offense can be removed and that the relationship can once again be restored. That's what God wants, isn't it? Restored relationships. But he wants us to fess up, <laughs> to confess our sins to him. Look at verse 3. He says, For I know my wrongdoings, and my sin is constantly before me. He says, Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Right? Guilt 
It just will eat you from the inside, won't it? It destroys you. It kills you. It, it creates all sorts of disorder. You know, even people in the world who don't fully commit themselves to Jesus and to God know right and wrong. They know what's good. They know what's evil. They know and they're convicted of that. And so many people today are depressed and destroyed and distraught because they're living a life that the world lives freely. But deep down inside, people, people know. People know that those things are wrong. People know it's destroying them. People know that it kills them and hurts others. But their attitude right now is, I don't care. I am who I am. I'll do what I want to do. I'll do what feels good. I do, I'll do what feels right. But as Christians, we realize that it is God who we offend. And we stop and we say, God, forgive me for my offense. Forgive me for my sin. And oh, what a blessing that is, forgiveness, to be able to say, God has removed my guilt. <laughs> right? God has freed me from the burden of my sin. And David is saying that this sin, it's always before me. It's in front of me all the time. I wake up in the morning and it's there. I go to bed at night. It's there. Everything I do, every happy thought I might have, every desire I might want, it's just right there in front of me. It's ripping the joy right out of my life. Well, what a blessing it is to just say, God, take it from me. Remove the guilt of my sin. Here it is. I'm, I'm guilty. I've done wrong. I've committed this sin, and I want to change, and I want to do what's right. Look what he says. Behold, he says, I was wrought forth in guilt, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in secret you will make wisdom known to me. Purify me with hyssop. And I will be clean. Cleanse me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and wipe out all of my guilty deeds. Now, David is not saying that he's born guilty of sin. That's not his point at all. But he's making the point that all of his life, that he just keeps messing up, you know? And this is just, it's one of many, it's a great grievous sin, but it is the one that has, like we might say, broken the camel's back. It's the, it's the one that has really caused him to stop and think and really caused him to pause and say, ah, look at me. Look what I've done. Look at the things that I do. Look at all the times that I have offended my God. I'm not worthy of forgiveness. I'm not worthy of his grace. I'm not worthy of his mercy. But I'm going to appeal to him as unworthy. <laughs> you know, from my mother's womb, I feel as if I have always lived in sin. I'm a sinful person and I make horrible decisions, but God, turn your face from my sin. Wipe me from my guilty deeds. Change the situation. Restore the relationship. Bring me back to where I need to be. But see, here's the dilemma. Here's the struggle, right? Here's the struggle that David is seeing and we feel ourselves, and the struggle is this. We know we have committed a sin against God and there's nothing we can do about it. I can't fix it. I can't change it. I can't go in the, back in the past and change the situation. It's done. It's already been committed. The lamp's already broken. The shattered all over the floor. All I'm waiting for is for the hammer to drop, right? I mean, that's, that's it. I'm guilty. I cannot change the situation of my guilt. And it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how good I am. It doesn't matter that I live the rest of my life obedient to God. There's nothing that I can do that's going to change my situation. The only hope that I have, the only hope that I have is taking my guilt to the one I have offended. And that that one is faithful to forgive me of my sin. That's the only hope that I have. The only hope that I have is that God will forgive me because it's impossible for me to undo what I have done. It's impossible for me to free myself from the guilt. I have to lay it in God's hands. 
God is the only one who can forgive me of my transgressions. He is the only hope I have. And we cry out like David, and we ought to. We ought to feel this kind of guilt and feel this kind of remorse. We need to be convicted of the sins that we have committed. And we need to be like David, and we need to cry out to our God and say, Create in me, create in me a clean heart, God. Restore me, forgive me of my sins, but not just that, not just forgiveness, but change me. Change me from my very core. I have been a sinner all this time. I've committed so many sins, and from my mother's womb, I feel that I have always sinned. Change me. Don't just forgive me, but change me. <laughs> Make me different. Take out the heart of stone and put in me a heart of flesh. Create in me a clean heart, God. Renew a steadfast spirit with me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Right? When we confess our sins, when we confess our sins, we need to be willing to change. It's true with all things, isn't it? It's true when you're a child and you've disobeyed your parents that, that just saying, I'm sorry, is not good enough. Just saying, you know, I'm never going to do that again, is not good enough. But the overwhelming feeling of, of guilt and remorse and the overwhelming feeling of, of freedom and peace and joy that comes from forgiveness ought to motivate us, encourage us to live a different life, to be restored once again. It's yes, it's possible to be hard-hearted. It's possible to take it for, van advantage, dis for advantage and take advantage of it. That's what I'm trying to say, right? It's, it's possible, isn't it? It's possible to say, well, you know, I'm a sinner and that's who I am. I was born that way and God's grace is covering me. It's not what David's saying. But it is possible to say that's who I've always been. It is possible to say, well, I don't think I'll ever change. It is possible to just simply say, well, God's grace will take care of all of my sins and I'm not worried about it. I don't think any of those attitudes represents what David is saying here, is it? David is not saying, Lord, I know I'm going to sin again, so I hope that you cover that one too. <laughs> it's not what he's saying. He's saying, no, God, forgive me. Hide your face from my guilt, cleanse me from my sins, but not just that, change me from my very core. <laughs> change who I am. Change me. Create in me a new heart. Restore the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. And when we confess our sins, we need to be willing to change. We need to be willing to change. We need to pray for renewal, right? We're talking about prayers of confession, and I understand that, but those can become hollow, right? Those can become empty. Those can become routine. Those can become a privilege. And I'm not saying a privilege as in we have the privilege of doing it. I'm saying we just take advantage of it. And we just say, well, I'll just, I'll just confess that sin later. I'll just, I'll deal with that when the time comes. I'll do this, but I can always confess it, right? I mean, that, that's, not, that's not how it's supposed to be, is it? It's not about just being able to go to God and say, God, forgive me of this one too. Sorry, I did it again. I'll try to do better next time. It's not just a prayer like that, but it's a prayer that says, God, I am broken on the inside. I am broken. You have broken my bones with your word that has convicted me of my sin. I am distraught. I am broken. My heart is broken. I need to be renewed. I need renewal. I need a new heart. I need a new life. I need to have a spirit that desires to do nothing but obey you that that's the kind of confession that God is looking for, remorse and sorrow for committing the sins that we have committed, but a prayer of renewal, that we will be changed, that we will be transformed from the inside, that we will once again feel the joy of his salvation, that we will restore to us, that he will restore to us the joy of our salvation and sustain us, 
sustain us, right? So that we won't sin again. Now, we're not saying that we're not going to make mistakes. Don't hear me say that. But our desire changes so that we will have a willing spirit. That's what David wants. That's what David prays of his God in this psalm. Look at the next verse. He says, then I will teach the wrongdoers your ways, right? I mean, isn't that true? Forgiveness overflows into others. When we're forgiven of our sins and we know the will of God, we've been convicted of our sins, don't we want to, to, to tell others about it? They don't always want to hear about it, but you know, that's, that's the overflowing nature of the joy of our salvation. That I will teach the wrongdoers of your ways that sinners will be converted to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips so that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I'd give it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God you will not despise. So David's not saying that the sacrifices commanded are not worthy. He's not saying that they're not important. But he is saying that when, you're, when you come to God with your sin, that if you're going to come to God with your, your burnt offering or your lamb or your sin offering, and you're just going to say, well, sorry, did it again. Here's another one. I hope this takes care of it. If you need an extra, I'll throw in an you know, extra lamb. No. No, but it's each and every time coming to God with a contrite heart, a broken heart, a distraught heart, a sorrowful heart that is truly repentive of the sin that they have committed so that they may receive the forgiveness that God is offering. We confess our sins. We confess our sins to our Father because we are confident that He is willing to forgive us. Right? Otherwise, we wouldn't do it, right? But we're, we're confident that when we take our guilt and our sin and we lay it before God, that we are confident that God is willing to forgive us because we know our God. We know our God, and our God knows us. So that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and that He is righteous so that He will forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. You see, as Christians, as people who are in a covenant relationship to God, we need to go to our Father in heaven. We need to go to Him when we have sinned against Him, and we need to pray to Him. We need to confess our sins. We need to confess to our God. We need to confess to our Father because we know our God and we know our Father as righteous, as faithful, as forgiving, and as willing. And we know that He will restore to us the joy of our salvation and sustain us with a willing spirit. So this morning, if you haven't experienced the joy of your salvation, of God's salvation, and you desire to, to be freed from the burden of sin, the baptistry is ready in, for, so that you may obey the gospel and be buried with Jesus in water and have your sins forgiven. Maybe you've done that and you've been a Christian for a while and you've had these sins and you have, you're, you're guilty of and you're just holding them in and they're tearing you up. Don't let them do that. Confess those sins to God. Repent of those sins. Desire a clean and new spirit, a clean heart. Pray to your God. That's what He desires of you. And if you need help from this congregation, we're here for you to pray for you as we stand and as we sing.